I am Ángel Calderón, professor of economics and researcher of the Center of Economic Studies of El Colegio de México. And I am with James Robinson, director of the Perston Institute at the University of Chicago. Professor Robinson has been granted a large number of prizes and awards. Yesterday, he was granted another one, the 2022 Daniel Cosío Villegas Prize, which is a very significant prize for the academic community in, in the Colegio de México. And I think it's very important for the overall social science community in Mexico. The, the name of uh, James Robinson is linked to Cosío Villegas. I think it uh, has a peculiar uh, meaning for this year's uh, uh, prize because it's the first time it has been granted to an, to an economist. And, uh, but a peculiar kind of economist, the kind of economist that Daniel Corsio Villegas was. But I would like to say, you know, obviously I'm very honored, uh, very happy to be here and, and very honored to, to, to get this award because, you know, as, I, as, as you say, as I figured out, as you know, as you, as you figured out, as I figured out, there's definitely some connection between <laughs> between Senor Villegas's career trajectory and mine. You know, starting out as an economist and having the kind of intellectual framework of an economist, but then realizing that to address the questions that you're interested in, you needed to bring in history, you needed mm -hmm. to bring in politics, and you needed to, you know, you needed to kind of broaden the the perspective that you had. Mm, interesting. You were saying that. Uh, you were to this uh, uh, political sciences uh, classes and seminars, and there were just a lot of discussions, a lot of same talking in, uh, among economists, uh, especially in Mexico. Uh, but uh, as I take it, you would uh, agree that uh, uh, you have a more systematic, a more trying to do some more consistent analysis and uh, to put all these uh, econ uh, all this uh, uh, history kind of uh, uh, processes or per peculiar stories or uh, tales or or you you learn of the Greeks and then you learn of the industrial revolution and then you 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 combine it with your uh, understanding of what's happening in Yemen and somebody gives you some additional material so you come with a lot of things that could give you a, a very interesting and uh, uh, conversation but when one reads your 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 uh, articles or your books you can tell there is some consistent analysis there is some uh, framework I, yeah. for analysis right so would you say that uh, uh, your framework requires some 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 uh, additional effort in trying to be more systematic because uh, say for example your new book which is called the the narrow corridor which is really very quite uh, interesting from written by by the same authors who did the white nations fail mm. right so in white nation fails you have this idea of extractive institutions inclusive institutions right and why uh, prosperity really depends mm. on on depending on having inclusive institutions both politically and and economically but uh, here you you have a more elaborate uh, analysis no if you can you can tell that uh, you need a strong state but you also need a, a strong social society no yeah. and they if you want to growth and then you put uh, more in economic incentives in the middle and then political freedom and then uh, I mean you, you you go behind the the idea of Leviathan you talk about the spotic Leviathan chuckle Leviathan why don't you you tell us where is this more the systematic analysis there yeah it's not only yeah I mean I think I think you know <coughs> we have this style I suppose not not it wasn't intentional Stylized. yes which is you know because we're both trained as economists 
we, you know, we have this urge to sort of simplify and have a framework to think about, you know, to think about the world. Um, and, you know, but, but we're also, both of us, like, very, we're very interested in details, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, so I'm, I, I, I spent a lot of time reading history books or kind of anthropology books or about some very specific thing. Uh, and, you know, and so just examples of, like, things that go on in the world. And we're always discussing those together, you know. And, but, but we're always trying to sort of put them, fit them. Where do they fit into some bigger, you know, like, there's a, you, you know, they're part of some bigger, you embed them in some bigger framework. And I think one of the reasons, you know, people like Why Nations Fail, that this one, this book is a little less successful, kind of, it's a bit too complicated. But one of the reasons people like it is, like, they like the simple framework but also they find memorable the examples we use kind of embedded in the framework to sort of illustrate it like Nogales or something you know or North and South Korea or you, you know these examples stick in people's minds uh, so so I think you know I think the different you know in some sense what you know the relationship between this book and Why Nations Fail you could say is Why Nations Fail we focus very much as you say on trying to explain poverty by you know, countries having these extractive institutions and, and, and economic success requires moving to more inclusive institutions, inclusive political institutions and inclusive economic institutions. But, but, but you know, we didn't, the, the book talks about some of the history and, but it, it, do, you know, it doesn't give a very good way of thinking about the longer run dynamics that get you to a kind of inclusive society. And so, and I, you know, so here, you know, so, so I think what we wanted to do here was, and also we, when we talk about extractive societies, there's a lot of extremely different societies in that, you know, in, so in Why Nations Fail, China, you know, it counts as an extractive society, but so does Somalia, you know, and China and Somalia are just radically mm -hmm. different. So one of the ideas in this book was to find a way of kind of unpacking mm -hmm. Somalia and China and sort of saying, well, how is China and Somalia different, you know, from each other? And, you know, and how are they different from, from a kind of success, success, what we would call a success story or a society that gets onto a transition towards mm. inclusive institutions, which, you know, you, you know, use, the t you use this terminology. We, we talk about this in terms of the different types of states that emerge, like a shackled Leviathan is a strong state which is shackled by society. So it's a strong state, strong society, and that's the sort of underpinnings of, it, of inclusive institutions, inclusive political institutions, inclusive economic institutions. But then, you know, there's a strong state, strong society, but then you can, it, you know, you can, be off the, you can be off that balance in either direction. So the state can dominate society, that's the Chinese case, or society can dominate the state, and that's the Somali case. So, so the model seemed to sort of create, it, was, it allowed us to talk a lot more about the variation in the world in an interesting way, both sort of today and historically, you know. Um, and I think also what I like about the book is it gets across much more this idea that, you know, building a shackled Leviathan or building a strong state, strong society, building inclusive institutions is a process, you know, it's a dynamic process of this interaction between state and society. And I think that's much more helpful than what, what, in Why Nations Fail, it sounds too easy to go from, you know, you have extractive institutions, you need to go to inclusive institutions. It's like not dynamic and it's not, you know, it's not path dependent enough. So I, 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 we find, I find, we thought that framework was very appealing for talking about the world. And it also allows us to talk about a lot of other things, which, you know, which we think are a lot of misconceptions in social science, like this idea of modernization, you know, the end of history, the idea that somehow all societies are going to end up looking like Western liberal democratic countries, which I've always found completely ludicrous. You know, I don't know how anyone could possibly have convinced themselves that history was going to end, you know. But in this model, you know, it's, this model is not about convergence, actually, it's about divergence, you know, that the world is radically divergent, it seems to me. You know, if you look at the history of China, you know, China looks nothing like Western liberal societies. And it, and it, maybe it did, you know, you have to go back at least 3,000 years. You know, we talk about that in the chapter on China. If you go back 3,000 years, maybe you see something like city-states with accountability and whatever, you know. But, but since the first dynasty emerged, you know, you don't see anything like that in China, you know. So that's highly persistent, and the political history is very different, you know. The history of, you know, Western societies is very different, you know. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think that framework also allows us to talk about this sort of, uh, this, this divergence in a way that we found kind of nice, you know. It's like, it's one thing to just talk about it, but it's, it's, it's another thing to have a framework, you know, in some sense where you can sort of say, you know, why, why do you expect this divergence? And, you know, so then we can talk about the mechanisms that underpin 
the divergence, you know. Uh, you also have like a, an interesting interaction of uh, the state, or if you want to call it the elite or the power, right? And the society or the so civil society or non-state, right? How, how, how do they interact? How do, because one implication is that the that the stronger the social society is, the more political inclusion there is, the stronger can be the state, no? The, yeah. Or is it more of a yeah. pressure or the yeah. other way around, no? The, if you don't, uh, if as a society you allow the despotic uh, authoritarian uh, Leviathan to impose itself, then you this society will get weaker and then the prosperity will, will go back. I mean, yeah. you, 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 may, you end up um, without progress and the stock no? stagnate. Yeah, so that's, that, you know, so that's, it's a very sort of conflictual <laughs> situation. You know, we depict this. I mean, we have a mo mathematical model, you know, mm -hmm. of, uh, which, you know, uh, here uh, underpinning this, which is a kind of dynamic game, you know, mm -hmm. uh, between state and society, you know, where there's a real sort of contest. You know, I think if you look at the history of, you know, the development of institutions, economic or political institutions, it's very contested, you know, it's, it's very conflictual. It's not some harmonious process of elites creating prosperity mm -hmm. or, you know, and it's not some writing the constitution and, you know, only Latin Americans think you can solve all problems by writing the constitution. Uh, African as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, 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 you know, but, but, uh, so it's very much a contest, as you say. So, so, and 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 you know, developing a strong state and or strong society emerges out of this contest. So, so uh, you know, and it's not just a matter of writing laws because you have to enforce laws and people have to demand laws. And so, I think that 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 you know, and and there's you know, but that you know. Building a shackled leviathan, you know, mm. that happens in what we call the narrow corridor, hence the title of the book, you know, where there is this balance between the state and society. And if one, if that balance, if that topples over, if the state gets too strong relative to society, then you spin out of the corridor and that's when you go to this much more despotic state, the despotic leviathan. And then, but then when the state dominates society, you might think, okay, that's going to be a very strong, powerful state, but actually it isn't because it's only the competition with society that makes the state really strong. So one of the predictions of the model is, you know, actually, you know, a state like in, you know, North America or Western Europe where the shackled leviathan, the state is strong, society is strong. The state is actually stronger than a place like China because, because it has the cooperation of society, because it's actually pushed by society to act in the collective interest. The Chinese state, you know, acting in the collective interest is at the whim of the Communist Party, you know, and I think we just saw recently with this fiasco with respect to COVID, for example, the Chinese state doesn't act in a kind of rational way or it doesn't act in a kind of way which is collectively desirable, you know. Uh, of course, in that case also, it was forced to change its way by society finally managing to organize protests despite the despotic nature of the state, you know, and they have to back away, you know. So, so, so I think that, so that, that's, a, that's a sort of interesting prediction of the theory that, that these, you know, shackled leviathans are actually more powerful than despotic leviathans, which might be, which could be the opposite of what you might have thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought also quite interesting the idea of this corridor effect and the the fact that uh, social society, social the the non-state part of the this dynamic game has to to keep uh, becoming stronger and stronger no? to to for economic uh, growth and yeah. improvement of. Uh, of uh, income distribution and uh, uh, to have a even to have a, a better response from the state to solve the collective problems in uh, in, uh, in the economic in the <coughs> economy. Yeah, I mean, you could almost think that the you know I'm not sure if you look at say the development of the English state mm -hmm. <coughs> in the early modern period that you know the state was focused on economic growth. I mean, mm. it was focused on controlling society, on raising taxes, on, you know, you know, it was being operated in the, in the interest of some people. Uh, but a lot of that 
process of building state institutions, it had to contest with society. Of course, those institutions mm -hmm. subsequently became extremely valuable for providing public goods or supporting mm -hmm. economic growth or whatever. But I think it's, it would be disputed by historians whether that was the intention. You know, but we, we, you know, we tell this story, I think it's one of the most, ni it's one of the nicest illustrations of what we have in mind of what went on in 18th century England, where, where you know, for the first time the government builds this bureaucratic fiscal system, this excise tax system, which is constructed everywhere. So they employ thousands of these excise tax collectors all over the country to kind of monitor production of c different types of goods, beer and bread that are being, excise taxes are being levied on. So this is the first time most people in, you know, rural England have ever seen like official bureaucratic tax collectors before. And, and, you know, so this, the state, this is the state exercising enormous amount of, you know, what they call infrastructural power in sociology for the first time. So, so then what does society do? You know, well, it, this is very threatening to society. So society reacts against that. You know, so the state gets strong to raise taxes, to monitor people, to collect information, and society reacts to that. You know, and so what you see is a very significant change in the, the nature of sort of contention and collective action. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you look at, um, uh, you know, if you look at like what people protest about at the start of the 18th century. So when there's a business cycle depression or, you know, there's, you know, the price of bread is too high, you know, or there's unemployment or wages are falling. And who do you complain to? You complain to the local squire or if the price of bread is too high. You know, you, 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 you complain to the baker and you accuse the baker of, you know, st stealing money or whatever. Uh, but then that's very parochial. It's very, you know, disorganized, very local. And then what you see is, you know, a real change and that people start organizing on a larger scale and they start protesting, you know, when there's a business cycle depression, they start, they don't blame the baker you know, or the local squire, they blame the system, you know, or they blame the government or, you know, they, they, they so, and organization, they get organized, you know, they form associations and, and, and so that, that's society getting stronger, getting better able to exert collective action in our, in our language. And that, that, and then what are they trying to do? They're trying to control this more powerful uh, state. And in some sense, the culmination of that process is the 1832 First Reform Act, you know, which is the first serious kind of democratization in, in, in early modern mm. Britain. So that's a sort of fascinating period that captures exactly uh, what we have in mind. Mm. And do you think it, 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 in a way you can help you this framework to understand all the current uh, transitions or, or things that are happening around the world? Say, for example, would you say Chile is a, a country where is closer to the narrow corridor than other Latin American countries? Or? I think so. I mean, we, you know, the Latin America, it was difficult to fit Latin America oh, into this trichotomy of sort of, you know, absent Leviathan, shackled Leviathan, you know, uh, a despotic Leviathan, you know, China, Somalia, and, you know, the United States or something. So, so we, we, we struggled to think how to fit Latin America into that. And I think, like, the way we did it was to say, Okay, you know, we developed this trichotomy, you know, with a very simple mm. set of mechanisms. But there's obviously more mechanisms in reality, and that's what you need to think about Latin America. So in some sense, what Latin, to talk about Latin America, we introduce this idea of a paper leviathan. You know, like Chairman Mao said, the United States is a paper tiger. It, like, looks powerful, but really it's phony, you know. Mm. So, so, uh, uh, so what, what does a paper leviathan it's, it's sort of like weak state and weak society, you know. So, so that sounds kind of weird, you know, because in, 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 the, in the first model, you know, in the, in the first, when you have this trichotomy, weak state, weak society sounds like they're balanced, you know, so they could be close to the corridor. But so then they should start, things should start moving. But they don't because there's m other mechanisms that we describe that keep the state weak and society weak at the same time. So that turns out to be a kind of steady state, you know, something that you're trapped in. But I think the good news is, of course, you're closer to the corridor than Somalia or China is. So Latin America is in a much better position than many places in sub-Saharan Africa, all these very despotic places like Russia, you could say, or China, you know, so that's good news. The bad news is, is that, you know, these mechanisms are real and they're hard to, they're hard to change. You know, what do I mean by a mechanism? Well, I think, you know, like think about 
weak states. So in the, in, the, in the model where we were describing, you know, the English state wanted to develop capacity and build institutions, you know, bureaucratic tax institutions to tax and control people. So why don't Latin American countries, you know, do that? Like I understand President Lopez Obrador is not interested in building fiscal institutions or tax institutions. Mm -hmm. In Colombia, you know, rich people don't pay. In Guatemala, there's no income tax, you know, for example. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the most une unequal countries in the world and there's no income taxation. So why, why aren't the why don't they build fiscal institutions in Latin America? Well, because rich people are not interested in having institutions that tax them and they're sufficiently powerful. Plus, you know, weak states can be exploited. You know, like what you see all the time is people with power and influence can exploit weak mm -hmm. institutions to their advantage. They can, they can enforce, you know, what is it that, um, is it Ben Venides, the Peruvian president said, you mm -hmm. know, to my friends, everything, to my enemies, the law. Uh, you know, you, uh, was it, was it, was it? Okay. Okay. So, so, so that's an example of, yeah. you can manipulate weak states. So the, the, there's, there's an advantage, there's, you know, there's interest involved in having weak, weak states too. So that's one of the mechanisms that explains this kind of paper Leviathan equilibrium, you know. That's interesting because then uh, there is some change of uh, regime, government, but you keep the same in institutions, the same in incentives, the same uh, vicious circle. Yeah. So apparently uh, a different uh, elite or the elite are, the, are to blame about the problems, but then there is a change of government. And, but you keep the same elites or probably the elites change, but since they have the same, they are, they are acting under the same set of incentives, so they, they act and end up doing what the previous elites were doing. No? Well, so I think you see quite a lot of that in Latin America, mm -hmm. don't you? Like one of my friends is a Peruvian political scientist at the Universidad del Pacifico. Mm -hmm. I met him recently at a conference at Harvard, and I was talk asking him about President Carrillo. Like, is this mm -hmm. true? You know, what people say about, you know, he was a school teacher. He was from like the Sierra. You know, he seemed like a very honest man. You know, is, you know ha did he become so corrupt so fast? And he said, yes, but, you know, it's, it's different. It's, it's humble corruption. You know, it's different people, different people being corrupt, but, but different beneficiaries. But it's still the same thing because, because there's a logic to the system, you know. And, like, once you get into power, you may have good intentions, you know, but, but it's very hard to kind of change society and, like, actually do the types of reforms that maybe Senor Carrillo wanted to implement but it's very easy to steal money, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say also, you know, my knowledge of the Colombian political system is that the political system in Colombia is actually designed to do that. You know, it's designed to make you corrupt. They call it like rabo de paja. You know? mm -hmm. Like yeah. everyone has rabo de paja. And in fact, when you enter government, you ha they want to take, get rabo de paja on you. To, so, you so you become, they want you to be corrupt, to control you and... So you don't spoil so the game know, uh, for everybody else. It's just like a glass ceiling, no? So don't, yes, don't, 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 don't throw, throw, don't throw uh, stones because yeah. your, your ceiling is also Yes, stone. absolutely. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a mechanism, it's a mechanism yeah, that helps this, this equilibrium reproduce because you have insiders who are very corrupt. And when new people come, that's threatening to them. So they need to make them corrupt too so they can control so, them so, the game Sounds familiar. Continues. Sounds familiar. <laughs> 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 I have seen, where have I seen that? Yeah, yeah I have seen that. So, so this, uh, you, but talking about, uh, again, uh, uh, Latin America. So if I, if I go to your framework, then a uh, corollary is that uh, you are at, uh, at a situation in a dynamic process where society is confronting uh, or trying not to lose space to a... Uh, to a state which is always trying to gain more sp space, right, and become more despotic, right? So to the extent that this uh, state starts uh, weakening institutions or destroying them, if they can <laughs> say political inst or institutions that uh, allow the society to feel more democratic to feel that they are more represented, to have more uh, uh, accountability, right? So if you have a process where uh, these institutions are being weakened, so that means that uh, in a way civil society is 
losing the mm -hmm. the fight. So we are going to end up having a a weak regime, which is not going to be able to have the the strength to uh, to promote growth or to improve the income distribution, but rather is going to to go into uh, actions or or going to into a situation where it will it will start uh, acting into a in such a way that it will keep strength, keep weakening the yeah. society, like, uh, like uh, for example, clientelism, yeah. right? Clientelism will be like, uh, what, what do you think about clientelism? It, it's yeah. strengthens or it, uh, or it's. Uh, no, no. I mean, I think I think you know that's exactly right. You know, the, 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 what you're just, what what you're saying is that somehow this paper leviathan is a kind of attractor, in the sense that you know, if the state is sort of you know, if you if you have this this combination of weak state and weak society, you know, imagine a world where the state was stronger. Actually, there'd be incentives to make it weaker. You know, that then to the extent that you know, so for example, in Mexico, you had. You know, under President Zedillo, for example, there was this institution building. You know, he built these electoral institutions and he tried to strengthen institutions. Then there's there's always an incentive to de deinstitutionalize things. You know, because but once you're in power, uh, right? If you are if you are out if, if no, you are the contestant, yeah, you have the institution. You have the incentive to strengthen yes, it, of course, right? Yeah, and once you're in power. You have the incentive to destroy them. Even, yeah, yeah. You want to make, even if you were the same guy to create more discretion. Thing. You know, because yeah. you're interested in. You know, I think clientelism is is you know extra, highly antagonistic to kind of state capacity or the strength of the state. You know, but it's very good politics. You know, but you need to personalize the state mm -hmm. and you need to deinstitutionalize the state. You know, to use. You know, so you can use political criteria mm. to make employment decisions, to deliver contracts and things like that. That's very good politics, but it's very bad for the it's very bad for the capacity. In the, in the long run. Yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, totally. Yes, because in a way, like uh, say this, it's not only Latin America. No, also there is a, a large uh, a number of books of American scholars saying why democracies die. Right? How can uh, apparently, democratic movements or democratic parties that gain power, once in power, right? They say, okay, well, we we like a democracy, but now that we are in power, we no longer like democracy, yeah. and we'd rather stay for a long run. Is that? Yeah. Uh, would you see that in uh, that happening in uh, Latin well, America? Well, you know, I mean, certainly you see that happening. I think you know, President Hugo Chavez, for example, mm -hmm. Chavez. Got, I mean, Perón. You know, I think most people would agree would would think that Perón, you know, won this, the first election in 1946, he was freely elected, you know, but then he fixed the next election. And, you know, and Chavez, Chavismo, you know, Chavez won an election, you know, he got into power democratically uh, to start with. And, you know, but clearly he didn't believe in democracy as a system, you know, and then, you know, look at what's happened in Venezuela now, you know, it's a kind of autocracy. Mm -hmm. So, so he undermined, you know, he systematically strengthened his own powers and his ability to control mm -hmm. state institutions, you know, the oil company, you know, he rewrote the constitution mm -hmm. to increase his powers. You know, he was able to mm -hmm. rule by decree basically without consulting mm -hmm. the Congress, you know, un under the constitution that he wrote. And so Chavez sort of consolidated his power and just basically undermined the mm -hmm. democratic institutions so so i think you know i think you know i think that's you know like i think that's that's mm -hmm. an incentive everywhere you know like we in why nations fell we talk a lot about these examples of you know you can have inclusive societies but in an inclusive society there's always an incentive to make it extractive you know because some people you know see them look at president trump you know president trump's strategy was to make the society you know he denied the election he wanted to make institutions more extractive mm -hmm. you know cutting corporate taxes for his friends and you know uh so i, I you know i think that you see that in, 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 in any society so I, I you know i think that can happen anywhere it can happen in mexico uh, i think you know one of the interesting things about mexico was that you know there was more institution building historically, I think, you know, and think about the roots of Mexico's economic success in the 20th century. That was, you know, the founding of the PRI, which was a sort of constitutional moment, you know, where the set of institutions were built, you know, which brought peace and order and stopped political instability. You know, the first four presidents were more or less warlords from the Civil War, if I, if I remember correct, correctly. You know, they instigated these term limits, these very effective, this social norm of term limits, which actually is a very powerful 
card in your in your hand at the moment. It seems to me. When did you grow this thing, this comparison of Bill Gates and and Carlos Slim? Well, we came up with it when we were writing the that, book. You know, that's we, 15 years ago. Yeah, about 15 years ago. And yeah. 15 since you like history and want to see the process, 15 years after you wrote that uh, uh, comparison, if you see the comparison nowadays, because for example, not long ago, we saw on TV President Lopez Obrador saying next to Carlos Slim and saying he's a great Mexican. I mean, he's a, has a, he's like a saying he's an example, <coughs> Almost an example to follow, right? So when you see that he keeps uh, 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 becoming wealthier, which uh, and you you think he's saying that because he's now Carlos Slim turned into innovative and uh, very productive modern technologies or different kind of sectors, or do you think, following your reasoning? that we have been stuck with the same institutions in spite of the fact that uh, uh, we have had a change of party in the government. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know why he's saying that. Uh, you know, I mean, I think Carlos Slim is probably richer now than, you know, he's not as rich as Jeff Bezos or, you know, um, Elon Musk, you know, but, but, but you know, uh, uh, but but you know he sort of spread his model all over Latin America. Mm -hmm. You know that the, the, he's involved in telecoms everywhere in Latin America nowadays. So you know he's still very wealthy mm -hmm. and very. He's sort of he knows how to play that game, I suppose. Uh, you know, uh, and that's extracting consumer mm -hmm. surplus all over Latin America. You know, uh, so I you know I, I yeah I don't know the answer to that. I think that's very persistent. You know, you see like Daniel Ortega made up with all the oligarchs. You know, Carlos mm -hmm. Pelais and all these people in in in, in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so you see that. You know, I think that's uh, that's a very common pattern. You know, money is power, mm -hmm. uh, and in a kind of in, you know, in an environment with weak institutions, money is even more powerful, you know. Mm. Uh, so I'm not sure I can, I know enough mm. about what's going on to speak, but I think that's a, that's a, that's a sort of repetitive, uh, that's a repetitive pattern of, you know, you were referring to before, like of, you know, you see this change, you know, you see, you see change, you know, you see new people coming and, you know, but, but the underlying system doesn't seem to change very much mm. at all. Uh, and this may be one kind of mechanism that, you know, these extractive institutions create enormous amounts of inequality. So there's almost always a huge potential for, cap for you know, for any politician to be captured in some sense by that. Uh. Mm, interesting. Let me ask you just a final question. Uh, when you consider the, the Chinese case, spotic state, and whatever, but you sort of say there is some meritocratic idea, right? And uh, bureaucrats are efficient and uh, some, there is some bureaucratic uh, or incentives to, to become better or to be better qualified or do things f uh, better. And uh, as opposed to a, a patrimonialist uh, state where they, what they really want is loyalty, right? Uh -huh. And you can even have a narrative against uh, a meritocracy because you link it to elites or whatever. Yeah. So I suppose that's that's also a, against uh, becoming more inclusive or more participatory or more uh, to, for growth or to do things better or or to avoid mistakes. No, what's your what's your feeling about it? Do you see? Do you think Latin Americans uh, are uh, understating the uh, the 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 need of some of of, of uh, recognizing people by their merit, their capacity, their I don't know, or is just. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think what you see, you know, historically in China is there is this norm mm -hmm. of sort of meritocracy. I mean, think about it. You know, China was the one part of the world, you know, where historically the elite were chosen through an examination system. You know, the elite in China, you know, apart from the kind of the imperial family or whatever, or the imperial families, you know, there was rotation there. But, but, 
were, you know, were people who'd passed mm. uh, the elite, were people who passed this examination, you know, which is, I mean, that, that's kind of amazing. Like, it's almost unique in world history. So, and that goes back, it goes back, you know, if you read about Confucius, Confucius talked a lot about that. It goes back even before that, you know, because Confucius himself said, no, no, I'm not doing anything original. I'm just telling you how it was, mm. you know, when the zoo uh, e e emperors ruled. So, so I think... I think that's part, from my perspective, I'd say, you know, I think that's part of the story why, you know, China can do so well for 40 years or whatever with basically extractive institutions, you know, that there is this element of sort of state capacity that's almost sort of cultural or, you know, like you're successful, you're, you know, you're a businessman, you're a, that we respect that in China. That's how Chinese people do things, you know, like I, I you know, if you look at the Students at the University of Chicago, for example, you know, you, I, we have a lot of Chinese students. I always ask these students, these Chinese students, like, where do they come from? You know, like, where, where do your parents live? Like, where did you grow up and go to high school? And you see they come from everywhere. There's like massive social mobility. Sure, there's elites in Beijing and there's party elites and whatever. Uh, but there's also shows from ability of a type that's kind of ima unimaginable in India, for example. You know, Indian students, totally yeah. different. They're all completely elite, you know, all of them. So, so that, that's interesting, and it's for real, it seems to me. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, and I think that's, again, that's very different from Latin America. You know, like, uh, Latin America is much more like India than China, you know, in terms of social mobility, in terms of, you know, caste, you know, the, the, these sort of hierarchies and distinctions. There's, you know, there's enormous kind of sociological reproduction of inequality in Latin America, it seems. And I, you know, I do, th I do think, you know, like the meritocracy is a problem. I think, you know, I think like Chile, for example, one of the reasons Chile has been successful is that they've kind of fought this struggle over, you know, trying to de-patrimonialize the state and trying to make state institutions more meritocratic and more efficient. You know, I tell my students in Colombia, you know, the difference between Chile and Colombia is like, you both have huge amount of natural resource wealth, but in Chile, they can actually use that wealth and build roads and schools and spend it in the public interest. And in Colombia, it all disappears in congressional political campaigns, mm -hmm. you know, and that's because the institutions are, are, are weak and they can be manipulated and, and you know, the money disappears and, 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 and is used in a discretion. So I think, I think meritocracy, I think we know there's huge amounts of evidence on this, you know, that uh, the historical evidence, empirical statistical evidence that, you know, building meritocratic, you know, civil service institutions is absolutely critical mm -hmm. for state capacity. You know, Weber, the kind of, you know, one of the founders of modern sociology wrote about this as being one of the kind of pivotal transitions in modernity. And, you know, that's still... Um, that's still a problem. You know, one of my students, a Colombian students, wrote a dissertation recently at University of British Columbia in Canada, you know, and he got hold of uh, all of the personnel records. He had access to all of the per sort of all of the personnel records of people working in the Colombian government. And, you know, 40 percent of people working in the Colombian government have relatives working in the government. You know, mm -hmm. so there's just, you know, so oh, okay. that's what Weber was talking about. <laughs> Oh, that's it. Well, fortunately, you had to take an airplane and we have to cut uh, short this uh, chat, which uh, we can go for hours. No? <laughs> but uh, it, it has been really quite an experience, not only for uh, for the researchers and uh, uh, at Colegio to interact again, because you, you had been here before and had... Uh, spend some time and give seminars and participate in our Congress. But uh, for our students, I mean, they, they were really quite enthusiastic. I think they, they were, were like, uh, I hadn't seen them like that. Uh, I thought they were like in a, with a rock star. Yes, yeah, taking <laughs> photographs or whatever. What, what was your, I mean, you, you, you had a possibility to yeah. talk to them. What, uh, what if, how do you, what, what would be your suggestions about what to do with our students? Uh, <laughs> given that you see, I mean, uh, you're the... Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I think, yeah, the interaction was extremely fun. You know, people asked very different sorts of questions. Some people asked very kind of precise questions about the research and, you know, wh why did I believe that was true and not this? And how did I come to that conclusion? Other, asked peop other people asked more general questions about... You know, m how do I think about research design and methodology? Or you know, why did I ask? Why did I? Why did I ask? Well, how did I get the idea for that particular piece of research? Or why did I a start asking that question? Or how did I get the inspiration for that? And um, 
So I found it. I found you know I found that great. I mean I you know I think I think that um, you know what's the advice for them? I you know I don't know. I mean, uh, 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 I think you know. Be very ambitious in, in thinking about the kind of questions you're you're interested in. Mm. You know, I think there's so many things. Like one of the things I was trying to emphasize is there's so many things we don't understand in the world. You know, uh, we don't understand. Like for me, you know, many problems of developing countries. Like you know, you've been in Congo and many places in Africa. You know, I don't think we understand like why there's so many talented mm. people in Congo. You know, there's just the, wealth, the amount of wealth that could be created, you know, if the place started growing, is just like mind boggling. So, so the losses involved are sort of staggering. Like, you know, I, I give the example in Col Colombia, you know, in 1960, you know, Colombia and South Korea had basically the same level of GDP per capita. And now South Korea is like a wealthy nation and Colombia is basically stuck where it was in 1960, you know. And South Korea, and it just look at, it's not just, South Korea is not just an economic phenomenon, it's a cultural phenomenon, it's just everything. I mean, and why couldn't you turn Colombia into that? Of course you could, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, absolutely, you know. So, so the, I mean, and we don't really, why, why doesn't that happen? You know, why, why doesn't that happen? You know, so, so how do we get out of this equilibrium of like crony capitalism and clientelism and kind of, it's a sort of, I mean, partly maybe it's a mindset, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you talk to Antanas Mokos, who was the former mayor of Bogota, for him, it's a sort of yeah, cultural peculiar transition. Character. Uh? Peculiar character. No? But it's a very pecu peculiar character, but his interpretation, but also a very, very clever man, mm -hmm. you know, his interpretation, he would say, it's a cultural transition. It's a kind of, you have to imagine, you know, what was possible. You know, what happened in South Korea, you know, was, in some sense, President Park, kind of shook up that very rent sinking, you know, if you go back and you look at descriptions of South Korea in 1950, it, it, it took, take, you took South Korea and replaced Mexico it, or Colombia, it would be the same. Crony capitalists, corruption, clientelism. Uh, and then President Park moved the institutions, you know, they, they started creating incentives to operate, to export, you know, to, you know, it, they created, the, 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 he nationalized the banks, I'm not, I'm not advocating that, but, the, but he nationalized the banks and started using the control of the banking system to create incentives to export, to grow, he started creating these targets, these, he just injected this sort of ambition in the, into the kind of development strategy, you know, uh, in a very strategic and interesting way. And the business people all responded. You know, there was nothing about crony capitalism that was inevitable. You know, they were just responding to the incentives, just as I was describing with Carlos Slim. You know, but, but once the incentives and the institutions changed, they started exporting. You know, and Samsung, instead of crony capitalism, became like one of the world's great, you know, tech companies. And they solved problems, they innovated, they learned from the Japanese, they did, you know, there's many, you know. So, so why couldn't that process get going, like, in... Latin America, it, it could, you know, what stops it? I, I don't know, I mean, it, whether that's something more, more deeply cultural or there's just something about people's understanding of the situation that stops it going. Like, when I, as I say, when I was talking to the beer monopolists in Colombia, I was asking, like, you know, like, look at, like, why can't you sell that beer everywhere, you know? Well, m maybe we, 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 there is too much focus on in Carlos Slim, but if you think that uh, Mexico has gone through large structural changes and it's now a major manufacturer exporter it's part of the nafta uh, 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 i would say the area right there are some uh, states in mexico and which have become quite competitive mm -hmm. there are uh, some new uh, firms coming on. So probably they are there, but precisely because they are being successful and they want to, they just, we hadn't been uh, focusing on them. Huh? Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Yeah, I mean, that's even true in Colombia. You know, you have, when you have sort of pockets or patches of extremely successful export business, you know, there's this Dais family, you know, in Barranquilla that's absolutely fascinating. It exports this incredibly high quality glass to all over the United States mm -hmm. and Western Europe. And so you have pockets of extreme sophistication, and but it never sort of spreads. And I'm sure that's even more so mm -hmm. in Mexico, you know, but they're kind of embedded in a system that somehow they manage and they can manage it. And 
they can be successful and they have different. I mean, it would be interesting to talk to people like that, you know, uh, about their perspective on the challenges and how one could make a transition to how do you spread that, you know. Uh, and I don't think, you know, I think like the South Korean case is sort of coming from the top, but that's not the case in Britain, for example. If you look at Britain's transition, you know, to the Industrial Revolution, that wasn't something coming from the top. It was something coming from the bottom more. Mm. So I think there's different ways of achieving that. Mm, well, we could talk for hours, but uh, you, we better take you to the airport. <laughs> Thank <laughs> okay. you very much. My pleasure. Yes. Yes. It was a pleasure to be, to be with you. And, Welcome back to Colegio. Okay, thank you. you. It's been extremely again. fun. And congratulations yeah. for the prize. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I, it's been fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs>